Hi folks, this is Sean Hyman, and uh, I want to talk to you about how to assess, uh, uh, assess enormous risks and to see bubbles and to see parabolic moves and for things like that for what they are and to be able to stay on the logical, measurable side rather than the uh, emotional side. And so I'm going to look at a few different um, ETF stocks and indexes and things of that sort and, and give you some e examples. Um, Typically, prices, and this is the, uh, the I'm looking at the, the IBB, um, iShares, NASDAQ Biotechnology ETF. Uh, typically, prices stay fairly close to moving averages, whether they're sideways or even trending. But the, what can happen is there can become these huge momentum moves that just seem like they'll never end. Um, when, when things happen like this, people just think... Um, you know, this is always going to go up. Um, they'll give you all the justifications and reasons why. They become very euphoric, very illogical, very irrational, uh, particularly in the latter stages of a move. But um, several things that you can notice is, one, anytime a move seemingly almost goes straight up, uh, it will have a massive crash down. Part of this one has happened, and part of it is likely still to come. But so uh, you can imagine this one has come from basically right at 400 on IBB to uh, to 239 uh, in a fairly short amount of time in an initial ABC correction. But uh, but there's typically, on longer term charts, a larger ABC that'll come out that'll be A, B, and then C. That So in, in the coming months to years, you will likely see biotechs dive even harder. Uh, but just to see that you know, when the price is way away from the 50-week moving average, but particularly the 200-week moving average, which is this red line here, uh, the price, it, it picture a rubber band attached to the price and attached to the moving average. You stretch the moving average, uh, you stretch the rubber band rather further and further and further away, and what happens eventually is there's a snap back uh, to, to the moving average, and a lot of times even over time an overshoot to the downside. Um, another way you can tell that a parabolic move is uh, likely getting out of hand and is going to turn. You know, in addition to the sentiment, the the news media coverage, uh, the euphoric state that it's in, et cetera, is is looking at the RSI on the weekly charts. And, and going back a number of years, this is a 25-year chart, which again, I mean, uh, you know, there's only it's not a full 25 years here because there's some blank data here. But uh, I'm going to show you some other charts that'll take up the whole chart. But as this was coming up, notice there started to be a, a, a time where the RSI started losing strength and, and moving down. It's called a divergence when the price moves up and the RSI moves lower. And uh, in particular, I use a RSI six period setting, so I don't use the traditional 14 setting. Um, but uh, but but either way, it would still have the same effect. That when this starts getting to the latter parts of um, its uptrend, there there tends to be uh, a divergence that takes place where the RSI is heading lower, which means that the uptrend is starting to lose its steam. Picture picture a jet, a, a, a guy just driving almost straight up to the sky in a jet, but then picture him cutting his engines off purposely. Well, when he cuts his engines off, that that's it's still going to rise some for a, a period, even when the engines are completely off and it's losing momentum, it's still heading higher. But the RSI is picking up that sense of loss of momentum, which would what would it eventually make the jet too? It would eventually make the jet turn downward and start diving, and so that's what the RSI and the divergence indicates there. And uh, we also started having a little bit of divergence there on the MACD as well, there towards the last of the uh, parabolic move there also. Um, so let me show you some other charts. So here's the Nasdaq. And, and, you know, here was the Nasdaq's bubble and parabolic move. Again, when a, when something does this, it's very unreasonable. Something like this is more reasonable and more sustainable. Something like this is not. Through the years, you can count on assets to do this. Uh, Bitcoin has done this twice, and, and Bitcoin is in a bubble right now. It's done this once, where it went up to 1,200 and went down to 200. And, and this is not a Bitcoin chart. This is the Nasdaq, but same same bubble type. Uh, Thing that's happened yet so it went from 1200 to 200 on bitcoin and it's in another bubble right now that'll that'll have a just a crazy pop as well uh real estate did it in uh 2000 late 2007 and early 2008 um 
you know, the NASDAQ did it back in uh, 2000. Um, it, it doesn't even have to be something that's tradable. Uh, Beanie Babies and Cabbage Patch Dolls uh, did it, you know, back in the, uh, what, 80s and 90s. So there's all, all kinds of times where uh, an asset will get totally outdone, and, and there will always be justifications for that, at the, for, for their greed and euphoria at the time. You know, uh, here when this was happening, people were saying, oh, it's a new economy, you know, uh, old stocks don't matter anymore. Those old stodgy stocks that have been around forever. You know, it's the new economy. Anything that was tech, anything that had a dot-com on the end of its name uh, was just flying. And, you know, people would say, well, yeah, a lot of these companies don't even make money yet. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's the new econ economy. You know, the business doesn't have to make money. I mean, all kinds of these wacko justifications. And all that happened in the bubble period. And then not only... So this is the fuller picture of it. Uh, again, it has an A, B, C correction, A, B, and then C is usually the longest uh, part of it. And bubbles tend to pop hard and swift, but they also tend to last over a good bit of time as well. And so this one went from you know, 2000 and didn't really bottom until uh, close to 2003. Um, so usually when bubbles pop, uh, nine months to a year and a half is, I would say, the minimum time they would take to, to pop and unfold on average. And, uh, you know, two or three years is not even uncommon. And so uh, it took many years before the NASDAQ finally found its footing. And even then, you know, it came up and then came back down to almost that same bottom level before really sustaining another move up. Well, uh, trends tend to move up in five waves, one, two, three, four, and then we're in five right now, and we're well into five. So, and and then... Again, notice the price got very far away from the 200-week uh, moving average. Uh, normally, in, when you're not in a bubble, uh, it still works. You know, when you see it get a good ways away from it, it still tends to come back at least to the moving average, if not some. So you can tell when it starts getting a good ways away from the 200-week moving average that, that the risks are high for uh, quite a bit of downside uh, versus upside reward. Um, same thing happened here. So in a in a uptrend that's early on and the valuations aren't overvalued, a lot of times you just get a pullback to the moving average area. But then when uh, prices are just uh, uh, high valuations, which they were here in in uh, late 2007, <clears throat> excuse me, they were in in 2000. Uh, there tends to be crashes that go way be below the uh, moving average. Here's your three wave correction here, A, B, C, or you know really your crash because it went from uh, what is it, 2861 to 1265, so that's a crash. 5132 to 1108, that's a massive crash. Um, and, and here we are five waves up, up again. We're at fundamental uh, valuations not seen since, um, you know, 2007 and 8, since 1929, since 1987. I mean, similar uh, risks and, and valuations, and, and unfortunately we will see a massive decline once again and you know nobody believed it here so I expect you know very few people that that see this video today to believe that that will happen as well because that's just how people get so gripped by what they want to believe and what they want to hear so um, again that's that's how you can tell when uh, assets are are risky and, and uh, in a in a bubble um, it's a way that you can stay rational uh, when things are irrational, there there's several things right now that are in dangerous bubbles. Uh, Lockheed Martin is in one of them. Look at far, how far the price is away from the 200-week uh, moving average and how long the parabolic move has been uh, going on. So this is in a massive bubble. Um, the the what they call the Fang stocks, uh, they're they're all that way. Some of them more than others. Look at Facebook and its price up here versus its 200-week moving average down here. Uh, so the A in FANG is Amazon. Uh, it's stretched even worse, uh, hit the 1,000 level, and has backed off that sum. But look at how far it is away from the 50-week moving average, and especially the 200-week moving average. Massive distance here, uh, more than it's ever been. And look, look at this parabolic move, you know, almost a straight-up move, just like NASDAQ just like some of these other charts I showed you, uh, biotechs, et cetera, and we're going to see a massive uh, crash there, in my opinion. Uh, so the N in FANG, 
is uh, Netflix, another parabolic move that, again, just you know, seems like it could do no wrong. And even the big corrections that it had before were bought up and went higher highs. So um, the danger of that is, uh, even though this is five ways up, one, two, three, four, five, so it's going to have a massive unwinding, people don't realize that. And so they think it's just going to be like this pullback or this pullback. And so when it pulls back, they're going to load up to the hilt on it again, thinking, wow, they're so smart because, uh, you know, they, they bought it on a pullback way off its highs, not knowing that it's going to crash, you know, way back lower. Uh, wouldn't surprise me if it went back to anywhere in the 20 to 50 range before it's all said and done. So uh, you know, Netflix is way overdone, got way ahead of any earnings estimate you could ever um pretty much half for the for the company. And and that's the thing. That's that's why one of the big reasons why these have to come back down to earth is they get in euphoric irrational momentum moves and the stock price moves so far ahead of any uh earnings ability that the company could even have, even the most optimistic high growth uh earnings ability that they could ever have. So they take a truth in a story about companies that are cutting edge, the future, high growth, et cetera, and they take them to an extreme and they push the uh, the stock prices out so far that the, the PE multiples, the price to earnings ratio multiples are so high that they go far beyond anything that could ever be justifiable. And eventually, uh, since the earnings can't shoot up to meet the price very quickly, the price has to come back down to meet the earnings. And so that's where you have these big normalizations and these big crashes happen afterwards. So F-A-N-G, uh, the last one is Google, uh, G-O-O-G or G-O-O-G-L, either one is uh, two different symbols for uh, for Google, uh, also known as Alphabet, which is the stupidest name ever, I think, but anyway, that's their name for it. Um, so uh, here we are again uh, in a big parabolic move, uh, another stock around 1,000 a share that's come off that. It, look at how far it is away from the 50-week moving average. Uh, which is your one of your first signs of risk, but the biggest risk is that it's far away from the 200-week moving average, and you're going to see a very large crash there. Um, let me show you. I think it's recorded on here. Eh, it's kind of recorded on here. So the the brick stocks. Anytime they make an acronym for a batch of stocks, it over time it becomes a bad thing. Um, Fang was Facebook, Amazon. Um, Netflix and Google, uh, BRIC, uh, you know, the, what they called the BRICs were Brazil, Russia, India, China. You know, they were the, the future, et cetera. And you can't see the whole move here, but there was, a, there was a ton of movement before this. If you looked at any of those ETFs before this one that actually joins them all together. But if you look at the individual uh, ETFs that uh, comprise Brazil, Russia, India, or China, they, they were moving up. Uh, in a parabolic move, and you can see part, of, just a portion of the parabolic move here when this ETF was formed. And uh, of course, you know, nobody thought it could do any wrong. I mean, it went from 1950 to, you know, almost 46 in a relatively short amount of time. So when this is happening, it's making the news headlines every day. It seems like you get up another day and the price is up again. Uh, everybody feels they're, like they're getting left behind. They don't want to be, you know, they don't want the train to leave the station without them, so they pile in. Towards the latter part of the parabolic move, everybody and their mama's getting in. They don't even know why. Uh, people that don't even normally invest in stocks uh, are, are getting in, et cetera, not knowing that this is coming. And you, you, can't, you can't get them to believe that this will come to save their soul. Yet this happened. you know. And parabolic moves, as, as hard as they go up, they go down hard as well. So it went from 45s to 1390 before it found its footing. And uh, the crash came, uh, its peak started in uh, latter 2007, uh, but it did have one more bounce up that people figured would go to another new high in uh, 2008, almost 2009. And uh, it crashed hard over the next uh, basically year. And, you know, like I say, it went from almost 46 to 1390 just on this leg of it, much less its ultimate peak, uh, with an A, B, C downtrend crash right there. So, uh, and then, if, you know, it had a, another bounce back up and then another move lower. So I think the bricks are actually, they've been beaten down for so long, forgotten for so long, um, 
and have had the ability to recover for so long that there's a huge chance that you're going to see them, you know, break this downtrend right here, which it's, you know, threatening to do right now and hold above that and start another uh, uptrend. And we're starting to see that with the, the what they call the golden cross, which is the cross of the 50 week moving average over the 200 week moving average, et cetera. But um, so way long time ago, the, the brick bubble popped, you know, the Brazil, Russia, India, China. Today, it's the FANG bubble uh, that is popping. And, and even in addition to FANG, they've also uh, put into that Apple, uh, which is in one of those parabolic moves as well. So look at how far away it is from the 200-week moving average. Um, so I, some of my uh, longtime subscriber Southern newsletters will remember uh, there's been several times that we've been in and out of Apple. And uh, in times when the price is far away from the 200-week moving average, Apple is everything. They're taking over the world. They can do no wrong. At least that's the way they're presented in the media. And then when they have these, these massive pullbacks uh, towards the average, uh, down here the sentiment is so pessimistic. They're, they're like, Apple's has-been company. It's done for you know, uh, its competitors are going to just eat its lunch. I mean, so they, it, it's why you can't go by the sentiment that you see on TV. Uh, you can't listen to, you know, your relatives, your friends, the, the talk around the water cooler, et cetera. It's almost always going to be wrong on both extremes. And so uh, when everybody was in love with it, you know, we weren't in it. When everybody hated it, we were in it. And so we would get in it, and it would do this massive run up. And I, I could tell that the risks were high because the price was so far away from the 200 week moving average. And we, we'd come out of it, and you know, we wouldn't quite call it top or anything like that. Nobody does. So it'd move up a little bit more, and then it would crash back down. And I'd see it finding support again, uh, support against its uh, moving averages again. And we'd buy back in again when everybody was hating it and second guessing it and all that. And it would move up again, et cetera. And so we, we did that two or three times um, in some previous newsletters that I've, that I've run. And, and um, you know, following things like that allows you to, to measure things. It allows you to look back historically. It allows you to remain rational when other people are irrational. It allows you to avoid getting caught in the downdrafts of parabolic moves that, that pop and head lower. Um, because, you know, this was a good, a good company the whole time, but there was times to own it and times to not own it. And, uh, you know, when it's going from 91 to 50, that's not a time to own it. When it's going from you know, 128 to 88, that's, that, that's not the time to own it. Um, you know, so, uh, and here it was like 26 back to 10 or something like that. So, you know, those those were not the times to own it, but after the downdrafts that happened, uh, after you see a three-way pullback, which happened here, ABC, uh, it happened here, ABC, it happened here, ABC. So, you know, and even more mini one here, A, B, C, et cetera, going down into that one. So you want to see it, you want to sit on your hands and give it plenty of time to get closer back to the moving average. You want to see that three-way pullback unfold. Uh, you want to buy great, solid fundamental companies when nobody seems to want to step in and buy them. And you want to avoid them or be selling out of them when everybody and their mama seems to think that they're rocking hot and the news media coverage is so great about them and that's what happens here and here and here they can do no wrong and uh the perception will be the sky's the limit and it's going to the moon and and but the perception and the sentiment at both these extremes are, are couldn't be further from the truth now uh since we are towards the end of five waves up uh apple could certainly this time around come back and, and far surpass its uh, uh, its moving average over time and, and really, um, you know, because it hasn't had a three-wave uh, downtrend, like long-term downtrend, in a long, long, long time. So it's very likely that the next one won't just ultimately, before it's all said and done, come back down to the moving average and bounce off of it, but there's a huge chance that it would uh, come back down to it, you know, bounce off to a lower high, and then and then dive off to something far lower. And I know people can't even fathom that that could ever happen right now. And I know that they won't believe it right now. But you know, you'll you'll see that it is very likely to happen. By the way, MACD sell signal here, uh, which is not good. You're seeing the the volume dying off, which is not good. Uh, the RSI was massively overbought and heading lower. That's not good. But the big big point of risk that's easy to point out. 
and it's very measurable is uh, is how far the price is away from the 200 week moving average in relation to what it's done in the past and the parabolic move uh, that's easy to be seen on uh, on long term charts. And say long term charts, you you got to go back on weekly charts uh, at least 10 years. You know, 15 or 20 is is it shows it even better because if you if you just go to uh, daily charts like a daily one or two year chart. This doesn't seem parabolic. Doesn't seem out of hand at all for you know for uh, for Amazon, but you know when you go back here and you look at Amazon on the long term chart, you can say, oh my gosh, it's it's in the stratosphere, and the chance of a massive fallout is very dangerous. But the people that look at short term charts and are just in it so close, and on the day to day of it, they don't they don't see this, and so they don't perceive those risks, and so that's that's how I'm telling you to be able to to notice those. So that's how to notice. Uh, the, the sentiment, the parabolic moves, the bubbles, the popping, the, the how far they could uh, go back to, um, the judging the risk about how far they are, they are away from the 200-week moving average, looking for the three-wave uh, corrections and, and crashes lower, um, et cetera. Those are definitely some things that, that are tips. They're, they're, they're tools that you can put in your tool chest to help keep you out of bubbles and crashes and things of that sort. And uh, it's something I used to use for my dad when he was still alive for his 401k to help him avoid crashes in his 401k. And we, we never experienced a crash. And uh, we experienced a lot of upside, but not major crashes. Now, I'm not saying we didn't experience pullbacks on the way. We did. But we didn't experience crashes. And a lot of his peers experienced crashes because they didn't have the knowledge of a lot of these things that I'm talking about. Um, and, you know, and, and a lot of that was in Lockheed Martin stock, which was what he was in. And, and we traded in and out of that through the years. But uh, Lockheed is in one of those parabolic moves now, and and you can always find people that will justify it. Like they'll say, "Oh, well, you know, Trump's pro military, and he is, and he's uh, adding, you know, he's wanting to beef up our military and spend on military, and he is." But see, there comes a point where you can take any truth, and the stock price has gotten so far ahead of the most optimistic thing that could ever happen for that stock, even accounting for all that good news, and that's what. That's what people don't understand is like it's like the stock has outrun the most optimistic scenario that you could ever justify for the stock, and eventually it comes back down out of the clouds. And when when these when these parabolic moves pop, they pop and they pop hard and they come down, you know, basically about as hard and as long as uh, as they went up. And so um, I don't know if you can. I don't think they still use that. No, they don't still use the uh, symbol anymore. But you know, AOL did it back in the day. Oh, here's another one. That's uh, uh, Microsoft is uh, is in a massive bubble right now too. I mean, so there's several of them that are that way. Uh, Microsoft had run up, could do no wrong. You know, back in around 2000, and uh, ended up going from you know 40 to uh, to the 13s and 14s. Uh, at the time, I worked worked for Charles Schwab. Our uh, our company stock went crazy, uh, went from the twos to fives up to 42, and then had a massive crash uh, down to 14, bounced back up to 36s, and then went down to the fives before it was all said and done. By the way, here's your A, B, C uh, crash and correction here before it found a footing. And and look, it took you know years for that to happen because the spike came up in 1999 sometime, and it didn't bottom until. Uh, 2001 sometimes, so a good couple of years. So when when these parabolic moves happen, a lot of people think, okay, well when they pull back a good bit, I'll hop on in and and buy. And that's the dumbest thing they could do because um, they're thinking, well, I've got it so far off its highs. I mean, surely it's got to be a value and it's going to go back up. No, and not only does it not have to go back up, it never has to look back, and it can it can still dive for years to come, not just mere weeks or a few months. So. Uh, the longer you can sit on your hands, usually the better, because uh, by the time they dive off, there will usually be some kind of planing out period where they're trying to build a base and build a floor, and that takes some time as well before you really start the next ascent up uh, and, and you know, that sort of thing, which, look, they're starting to get high risk again uh, on Schwab now with it in the 40s, and your 200-week moving average is down here at 29s and uh, quite a bit of space there. And, you know, each time that happens, usually tend to get a three-way pullback uh, to the moving average. And when you get at a state of overvaluation, it can even go far below the moving average, like we saw here, like we see here and here, et cetera. And we could definitely see that once again. 
So anyway, that's, that is how you assess risk from a very logical, measurable, technical analysis standpoint of view on long-term charts. So for the people that say technical analysis is only for short-term trading and so forth, and you can't use technical analysis as an investor, that just debunks that altogether. That shows you uh, that technical analysis can always be used, whether it's for long-term investing or short-term trading. All right, thanks so much for watching, and God bless. Bye-bye.